So we're still working our way through the first chapters of Genesis, uh, which we will be doing all next week as well. And there's so much in these as regards the, the identity of man and as regards uh, the role that we have and as regards sin and its consequences and effects and as regards the goodness of God. There's, there's a, a, a world of knowledge compressed and condensed into these first chapters. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I went into the community room here in our community, uh, here in Lincomera, and one of the girls was kind of upset. She was there crying, and um, so I kind of gingerly kind of tried to approach just to see was everything okay? Had she stubbed her toe, or was there something a little more uh, serious afoot? And uh, I said, are you, are you okay? Everything all right? And um, she said... Um, she said, no, no, everything's not all right. <laughs> do you want to talk? And I don't know. I said, do you, do you mind if I sit here for a second? So <laughs> it's okay. So we had a little chat. And uh, we had a little chat. And I said, Look, what's, what's up with you? What's bothering you? And she said, it's just so sad. Y yes, it, it, probably, it probably is. What, what exactly? What exactly is sad? And she's just so sad like that. So few people love Jesus. And then she said, and then here I am in a community like this. I receive Holy Communion every day. I go to adoration every day. And yet, I just don't love him enough. I just don't love him enough. And unfortunately, unfortunately I smiled at that point. I said, that is the most beautiful reason to cry that I've ever heard. Like to, to cry because you don't love the Lord enough. What, a, what an amazing realization, like, what, like really taking to heart uh, how much love the Lord deserves in comparison to how much we give him. That the Lord deserves our heart. He deserves it all. <clears throat> he deserves it all. And that's not necessarily what we give him. In Genesis chapter 3 here, there are a couple of details which I think are, are important to mention. Uh, this will be kind of a recap of what we've done so far. So the serpent, now, the serpent is the most subtle of all wild beasts that God has made. Was Eve afraid of the serpent? No, she had no reason to be afraid of the serpent. Some say that the translation is Leviathan, so they say that he was a, a big forbidding kind of a creature. But as a father was telling me recently, he has experience with his little son, his little, whatever, what is he? I don't know, two and a half year old little son who has absolutely no fear of dogs. Dogs are frothing at the mouth, yanking on their chain, they're scratching everything, and the little fellow just goes, doggy! <laughs> you know, just no sense of danger because he's never been hurt by a dog yet. That is going to happen. Uh, but uh, he just, all he sees is a cute little puppy doggy with little drooly drooly. Uh, no, that, that's rabies, and uh, <laughs> he wants to kill you. So, but, so it's kind of the same with Eve. Eve looks at this creature, and whatever, whatever way it looks isn't so important, because she had no fear. of All of creation was good. Right? Sin, hadn't entered the, sin hadn't entered the world. The fall hadn't happened. There was nothing to be afraid of. So she sees this creature, and she converses with it, okay? Now, again, pay attention to, the, to how Satan tempts her. Right? Because I don't think he has changed tactics much. It works pretty much the same as us. The same on us. So, the serpent asks the woman, Did God really say that you're not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? Now we know that's the question. The question is already seeding doubt. It's trying to plant doubt in her mind. Did he say that you're not supposed to eat of any of the trees in the garden? Why, why on earth would God say that? Sorry. Why would God say, Here you are in this beautiful garden. Don't eat anything. That's just, I mean, like, is God cruel? Is God holding something back? Why would he do that? He didn't do that, okay? Fast forward 2,000 years, or more or longer, um, to our day. Uh, did God create you in this world, surrounded by all these pleasures, and tell you you can't have any of them? Eh, that's probably what he did. He has all these good things that are out there. Don't touch any of them. They're all bad. That's, that's not what God said, right? That's not what God said. So... Were Adam and Eve hungry? No, they weren't. They were not hungry. There was just one single tree that they weren't supposed to eat from. Everything else they could. They were not hungry. Same with us. There are so many good, there are so many good things that we can do with our day that aren't sinful, that are life-giving. 
that are that God wants us to do. God wants us to engage in things that are fun, right? If if we had snow here, God would have absolutely zero problem with us having a snowball loving competition towards each other with with no headshots. Uh, God wouldn't mind, right? God doesn't mind us having fun, right? But the temptation is to think, yes, but you know, uh, intimate actions outside of marriage, they're way more fun, so you should do those too. Otherwise, God is holding back on you, giving you all these impulses and ideas and all these beautiful people and saying you can't have any of it. See, the, the temptation is the very same today, right? There are all of these good things that you can do, that we should do, no problem. If you want to avail of them, absolutely go for walks in the forest. Uh, do, that, do those things, but then there are all these other things that are even better that God doesn't want you to do because he's holding back. He's holding back true joy from you. If you want joy from God, if you want happiness, you have to take it from him. He won't give it to you. He won't give it to you. Take it. So disobey him, right? So are you allowed... Did he say you weren't to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered, we may eat of the fruit of the, we may eat of the, fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it, nor touch it under pain of death. So, we can eat of everything. This is one tree that we can't eat it or touch it or it'll kill us. Now, what good parent wouldn't say to their child, you can eat those strawberries, you can eat those raspberries, you can eat those gooseberries. Um, they're nettles. Don't eat the nettles. It's fairly straightforward, like. Uh, you being a bad parent because you do this? No. So, there's a, there's, there's a tree you're not to eat from. Everything else work away. If we eat it, it'll kill us. She knew that. And then the serpent said to her, no, you will not die. Direct contradiction to what God says. God says X, I say Y. Whatever God says, I will say the opposite. You won't die. No. But your eyes will be opened and you will be like God's. This is the, our adult understanding now of, of Genesis. We have to catch up. Okay, this isn't just a little cute serpent tempting them to eat an apple that they weren't supposed to eat. The temptation here isn't to eat food. The temptation is your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Okay, now the irony of all of this is a couple of days ago when we read Genesis chapter 2, when God creates man in his image and likeness. We are already like God. We're already created in his image and likeness. Satan wants us to steal something we already have. But in doing so, we, we tarnish it, we ruin it. We show that this image and likeness of God that we've been created in, if we now try to steal it or take it, it now makes us less like God. Because this image and likeness that we're created in is an image and likeness of love, an image and likeness of so God-likeness. Therefore, we're, we're loving, we're trusting, we're good. Stealing makes us less loving, less trusting, less good. So it makes us lose this image and likeness that we had rather than actually realize it even more. It's, 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 it's so counterintuitive, yet the, the temptation seems to, be, seems to make a lot, so much sense. You know, there's this wonderful tree. Eat from it and you will have more. Again, fast forward to today. We have these sinful actions that we're encouraged to do. Do these things and you will have more. But the reality is we do these things that God doesn't want us to do and we end up with less. We end up with, with shame, with no peace, with regret. With, 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 uh, we've given ourselves to people who don't care. And then we feel used and abused and forgotten. And it's just a mess. Just a mess. So God, what God promises us works. What the enemy promises us invariably, in the end, is an absolute disaster. And what's so diabolical about Satan as well is that he will be the one to push you to do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Go on, go on, do it. Do this thing. It'll be, it'll be fun. It'll, it'll make you happy. You know what I mean? You deserve this, right? You get pushed to do it. Then once you do it and you fall, look at you. You absolute miserable disgrace. And you having four children at home and a loving wife. And look at you now. And you having been an altar server for so long. And look at what you're looking at now on the internet. And you having been, you know practicing Catholic for so long and now look at you drunk as a lord you know uh, so you're pushed to do it and then when you fall then you're accused of doing it by the same person who pushes to do it in the first place it's so diabolical it's typically diabolical 
push, you're pushed to fall. When you fall, then you're accused of falling. It's just it's difficult diabolical. He will not leave you in peace. So, <clears throat> your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. They didn't need to know evil at that point because evil wasn't in their reality. Just like you don't talk to children about things that are evil and, and, and genocides and mass murderers. They're out there, but at least in, in a child's reality, those things, they haven't come across those things yet. They don't need to know. <clears throat> the woman saw that the tree was good to eat and pleasing to the eye, like most temptations. Looks good. Pleasing to the eye. Okay? And it was desirable for the knowledge that it could give. And so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Now, pay attention to this little detail. She gave some also to her husband, who was where? Who was with her. She gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her. Presumably, that far away, right? Do you remember a couple of days ago, we read in, in Genesis 2, after God creates man, the Lord took man, settled him in the garden to cultivate it and take care of it. Man's vocation, to cultivate and to take care, not just of created things, but also of his family, right? To protect, protect the borders, protect the home, protect the family. Why didn't Adam protect Eve? Why didn't he stand in between her and the serpent? Not because she's in any way inferior, but his job is to protect her. Hang on, if, sorry, sorry serpent, no, no. If you're saying that we should disobey God, why should we disobey God? Surely he has proven amply that what he wants for us is good. Why would you tell us to do something against God? Maybe we should actually just ask God. Sorry, God, Father, are you there somewhere? Yep, thanks. Um, we're just wondering here, this serpent here just suggested that we eat the tree, that it'll make us more like you. Is this the case? Right? Would have been a fairly good clarification. Would have saved a whole world of pain. <laughs> <clears throat> Not that I'm better than Adam, but I, I think that would have been a fair approach to things. Like, so, uh, yeah. His job was to protect her, and he, he, he fell short. He didn't do it. Man's role today is still protect your family. Obviously, starting by protecting your own heart. Protect your heart. Be a God-like man, in the sense of be a virtuous man. Protect your family. So, this was... This was the original sin that has now entered the world. They doubted God's goodness. They thought that God was holding back on them, that there was this <clears throat> grace of being like God, that God was holding back from them. He was somehow maybe jealous of them or didn't want to make sure that they, they remained inferior to him. Not the truth. It's just simply not the truth. God wants us to share in his divine nature. He wants us to be ever more like him. So as soon as they eat it, the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. Remember like we said yesterday, um, when moms and dads have <coughs> kids and you have three or four kids under the age of five and you horse them all into the bath at the same time. And uh, it's cute. Whatever. Uh, but, and they, they can do that because <coughs> the body of the other person doesn't lead them to sin. As soon as they eat <clears throat> of this fruit, their eyes are open, they realize they're naked, right? They, they experience shame. So now beforehand, when the other person's body would actually remind them of the goodness of God and the beauty of God, remember God who is uh, the transcendentals, as, as they're called, goodness, <clears throat> beauty, and unity. All beauty comes from God. So the beauty of the body of the other person would actually remind them of the beauty of God. Now, the body of the other person is actually a temptation. It now leads them to lust rather than to love. And so the, the, the order between man and woman is now, is now broken. That unity, that walking together towards God is now damaged, tarnished in some way. Man and his wife heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from him. Again, fast forward to us. We fall. What do we do? Do we run to God or run from him? Very often it's actually easier to run from him. We see a lot of that today where rather than sit down and, and uh, 
do a good examination of conscience, it's just easier to blame the church for having all these teachings that get in, get in the way of our freedom. It's easier to say a typical church now, no divorce, no contraception, no this and no the other. Typical church, what would they know? Just look back in the Middle Ages. Much easier to say that than, is this what God is asking? Is this, God, is this what God wants of me for my happiness? Much easier to hide from God. Or these days, of course, substitute the real idea of God with a God of my own invention. So I hide from the real God and I make up one of my own, a, a spirituality of my own. A spirituality, by the way, that I dictate, a spirituality that I decide, a spirituality made up by me. So of course it's going to be completely on par with my morality and my behavior and my way of life, because I just made it up. So rather than obeying God, I make myself God. Rather than recognize that I'm creating God's image and likeness, I create God in my image and likeness. God's like me. Complete reverse, diabolical, just complete reverse of things. Thankfully, in our psalm, the psalm kind of jumps forward uh, a couple of thousand years and gives us this beautiful verse, happy the man whose offense is forgiven. So original sin enters the world. Everything goes wrong. This original harmony between man and himself, man and woman, and man and God, all of this is damaged, tarnished, torn. And right from the beginning of time, God already knew how he would fix this. He would fix this with the greatest sign of love that humanity has ever seen, by becoming man and dying on a cross. Happy the man whose offense is forgiven, whose sin is remitted. Oh, happy the man to whom the Lord imputes no guilt, in whose spirit there is no guile. But now I have acknowledged my sins, my guilt I did not hide. I said, I will confess my offense to the Lord, and you, Lord, have forgiven the guilt of my sin. The story ends well, brothers and sisters. It doesn't end with sin. It doesn't end with death. It ends with redemption. And God willing for each one of us, it will end with heaven. Back into that perfect communion with God for all eternity. So we ask the good Lord to continue to renew each one of us and to renew our church. That we may be, that we may be a sign of this hope for all the world to see. Amen.